Mr. Chairperson, <coughs> I think uh, we are having an overdose of real-life data and uh, uh, RCTs. So I'll, I'll just uh, switch my gears to something else. Uh, it, it seems as if these two are at war with each other. The real-life data is at war with uh, the RCTs. They actually complement each other. They are not fighting with each other. And uh, that's what we need to understand while interpreting either our city or a real life data. So that's what I'll be concentrating upon instead of trying to sell a particular molecule. Now, first thing that we have to look at, real life data and our cities have their respective pros and cons. That's I'll be looking into. And we'll look into the CVOTs done with SGLT2 inhibitors. I think we're having a toxicity of SGLT2 inhibitors since morning. And most of these are patients who have established cardiovascular disease in whom this group of drugs have shown their benefit. But you see that the large majority of the patients in our clinics might not have cardiovascular disease. And how this group of drugs apply there, that's what I'll be looking into. And that is related to primary and secondary cardiovascular disease prevention. And where does dapagliflozin uh, you know, fit into the picture? Because it doesn't have a cardiovascular outcome trial like a Remparage or a Canvas trial. So automatic question is, should we wait for the trial to come? and reserve for prescribing this particular molecule, or we can still write it freely. Now, if you look at the pros and cons of RCTs versus real-life evidence, it's something like this. And uh, this is an example of real-life evidence, when this mammoth is being pierced by a lot of spears, and its neck pain suddenly disappears. So, but these people were throwing the spears to kill it, not to cure the neck pain. So the basic aim is different. So this is like Unnani and Patanjali and uh, you know, Ayush medicine and everything. This is a typical example of that. But you need not have any data, but you can just do whatever you want uh, to just achieve your end. But you might end up with something else. And this is the gold standard. The gold standard is something called double-blind placebo control trial, where neither the physicians or the treating guys or nor the patient who is taking it knows what's happening. So that's why it is gold standard, because it is without a lot of bias. You open your eyes and you might end up with something like this. So this is the elephant, but suppose this guy who is touching the trunk with the eyes closed is thinking, what trunk is this? It is a trunk of a tapir, a trunk of a marsupial rat, trunk of what? So until unless you open that you know, patti and you see the whole elephant, you'll never know that it belongs, the trunk belongs to an elephant. So that's what real life data and RCD is all about. RCD is about closing your eyes and touching the trunk. And real life data is opening up that, that uh, blindfoldness and seeing the whole picture. So there are two ways they complement each other. Uh, you first do a real life data, you generate a hypothesis, and then you confirm that through RCT. Or you do an RCT and confirm it in a very fixed population and then expand its indication through a real life data. So they complement each other. They are not fighting with each other. And this is how a typical funnel looks like of RCT and uh, real life data. RCT has strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. You cannot tell your patient that you are not fitting into the inclusion criteria of this particular trial, so I will not give you the drug. This doesn't happen in clinical practice. So when you have an RCT data on a fixed population, and then the funnel widens, because this is where we come into the picture as physician and, Im and increase or expand the indication of the product. For example, the inclusion criteria of a particular drug is between 18 to 75 years of age. Now, a guy who is more than 75 years of age is more likely to die from a cardiovascular de death. So will I not give this medicine to someone who is 76 years of age? I mean, this is ridiculous. And that is where we come into play. Common sense comes into play. So you cannot just have evidence-based medicine without the clinician's experience getting added to it. Just cannot dissect it out. So this is the summary of this part. The advantages of RCT is it is blinded, it is rigorous, it is randomized. No one knows what's happening, so it is devoid of all the biases, the selection biases, the immortality biases, a lot of biases. But there are disadvantages of it. And the disadvantages are, these are of short duration. And for example, if you have an inappropriate side effect, what, what do you mean by inappropriate side effect? For example, heart failure with saxagliptin. There is no mechanistic basis why there should be heart failure with saxagliptin. But that came out from a randomized control trial of short duration. Or maybe an amputation with canagliflozin. How do you explain that? It's a very short duration of the study. So that's the advantage of real life study. If you look at the top there, real life study is done in a non-selected population. And the advantage is useful to detect rare or late side effects. So you follow up the patient in real life for a longer period, irrespective of the inclusion criteria. And then you can conclusively say, oh, maybe the signal coming from an RCT 
is actually by chance. It is not a cause and effect relationship. That's the advantage. But the disadvantages of RCTs are the randomization. My eyes are open. I select the patient whom I want to select. And I'm extremely biased in the type of study that I want to do. And uh, there is absence of uh, you know, randomization. They are immortality bias, which I'll show you is there in, in uh, some of the real life data. Now, it is not uh, you know, true to say that RCT is a gold standard. And uh, without RCT, FDA is not going to accept anything. This is the, from the FDA website. And this is the recent uh, recommendation from uh, the FDA. Real world data and real life evidence are playing an increasing role in healthcare decision making. FDA is going to now accept such data for the regulatory decision making. So it is not that whenever you see your real life data, put it into the trash. If they are done in a very, very rigorous way, they are as good as an RCT. With this backdrop, let's look into the cardiovascular outcome trials that we had with SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, if you look at the CANVAS and the EMPARAGE outcome trial, we see that in the CANVAS program, about 65% of the patients had established cardiovascular disease, 35% did not have. It's a mixed cohort, though a bit disproportionate distribution. And in EMPARAGE, 99% of the patient had established cardiovascular disease. And in them, we found that they have a significant benefit in the primary endpoints. Now, based on this, the guidelines came up, and the recent 2000 and uh, the 18 ADA guideline has given a positioning that after metformin and lifestyle modification asks the first question, do you have an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or not? If yes, then IMPA, Lira, or CANA will have to be considered ahead of all the other drugs. If not, well, it's a cafeteria choice. Based on this, they have given uh, evidence level A for EMPA and uh, liraglutide because apart from MACE, they have shown to reduce cardiovascular mortality as well as all-cause mortality. And because those two are absent in CANVAS trial, there's evidence level C. Uh, what's the hurry? I just wanted to ask the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ADA recommending committee. He could have waited for August when the FD analysis of CANVAS would have come anyways and could have made that C into maybe B or maybe into E, anything. But there seems to be some hurry with the recommendation because it has to come in the January edition. We could have waited a little bit more. Now, in questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. Why I've given this slide is I don't believe in guidelines. I don't believe in consensus statement. I don't believe in a dictator on top telling me what to do. I think even my reasoning, my brain is strong enough to take decisions like you have a good brain to take your own decision. And individualization is done in our clinical practice. No one in the USA sitting in the Swiss Alps, seven of them on a glass of wine can decide how I am going to treat my patient in India. How many percentage of Indian patients were there in the outcome trial? What percentage of Indian patients were there in the LIRA trial? And I'm not treating German patient in my clinic. I'm treating Indian patients. So fine, you have given me your data and guidelines, but these are not sacrosanct. We can make changes, logical changes, evidence-based changes based on the data available. Now, Primary and secondary CVD prevention. All these data are now mostly done in the secondary CVD prevention cohort. That is those with established cardiovascular disease. Now we need to remember a few points out here, a few uh, you know, numbers, otherwise we are being bombarded by statistical game and we seem lost. In this room I'll tell something, in the other room I'll tell something else, depending upon obviously the backdrop sponsors. And that can be easily done with playing on the statistics. But this part from the FDA regulatory body is absolutely sacrosanct. You need to pull your uh, phase two, uh, B and phase three data together and place that data to FDA. And if you have a hazard ratio with two left-sided confidence interval, if the upper limit of confidence interval is less than 1.8, you are safe. You need not do a cardiovascular outcome trial. But if it is less than 1.3, then you are absolutely safe. Now, this has come with a little bit of a caveat. And I'll show you why the caveat has come. For in order to achieve this less than 1.8, you need to analyze 122 events. And to get less than 1.3, you need to analyze 611 events. Why? Because this gives power to the study. Power means with confidence I can say that this endpoint is exactly what the question that I asked for. If it is not, it is underpowered. It's a question mark. It may or may not be. So these numbers are very important. Now, all the experts of the world sat together and they wrote this particular review article, which is worth reading. If you can go, it's free, of course, for India. Just read it. It's ext extremely well written by all the thought leaders in the world. And what they have shown is, if you look at the Emparage and Canvas trial, and you look at the number of events which were analyzed based on which, whichever uh, you know, podium we are standing and saying with confidence that these drugs reduce cardiovascular outcomes and death or whatever, 
is something around 772 events in Empire's outcome trial and around 1,011 events in Canvas trial. Look at the numbers, they're so big, we cannot even answer or question this, this, this particular findings because this is exactly what it is satisfying the FDA criteria of 122 and 611 events. Now the question for us is, patients with established cardiovascular disease coming into a clinic is less than 15%. The vast majority of 85% of the patients do not have established cardiovascular disease. So how do we use these drugs? That's a very important question. Now in Empire's outcome trial, 99% had established cardiovascular disease. How can we extrapolate that data to the patients, the 85% of patients who do not have cardiovascular disease? Canvas program also had 65, near about 66% of patients with established cardiovascular disease. Now, what happened in the Canvas trial, independently, if you look at those who had and who did not have cardiovascular disease, independently the results were not clear. It's a pooled analysis which said that there is a reduction in MACE, and Bruce Neal, the author, came out with this publication and said, the design was such in this trial, it is underpowered to look into either of the two arms. When you pull them together, it is well powered to give you an answer. Which means, in spite of having 35% of patients without cardiovascular disease, we don't have an answer whether this drug reduces cardiovascular events in patients in the primary prevention cohort. And then there are problems now. Now you have drugs with established cardiovascular uh, benefits. So ethical committee most probably will not give any approval in future trials where on one hand you are placebo, because now they are saying that if you know that empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and liraglutide is giving cardiovascular benefit, how come you're not giving the benefit to the other arm? You have to add that to the other arm. Or if you say I'm going to you know, test a drug versus a sulfonuria, then they'll say first prove the safety of sulfonuria. Where is the RCT of a sulfonuria versus placebo proving its safety? So you want to prove that you are superior to a sulfonuria by selectively choosing that drug which may cause harm, so I will not give you ethical committee approval. Things are getting hard now after the positive data from these trials. Now if you look at this particular uh, CVD real study, which was done with dapagliflozin, large data, large number of patients from all over Europe pulled together, and you find there's a significant improvement in the cardiovascular endpoints, all cause death, hospitalization due to heart failure or combination of both. There's a very improvement, improvement in that. But now if I go back to my first slide and we can ask this question, this is a real life study without an RCT. So can we just take this and go to a clinic and tell our patients from tomorrow, I'm going to write dapagliflozin to you, it is going to reduce your heart failure, it is going to reduce your all-cause mortality? The answer is no. This has only generated the hypothesis. When the declared ME58 comes, complementing it, then only we can give you the definitive answer. Before that, it's a good hypothesis that has been generated. And this is the mortality and time bias based on which uh, most of the real life data sometimes gets caged because, uh, and, and, and the question marks are being put. Now, the question is then, I scratch my head when I choose an SGLT2 inhibitor in patients who do not have established cardiovascular disease. The first question is, is the drug safe? Second question is, is it uh, beneficial or not? Now the safety issue in the pooled analysis was done, for example, in canagliflozin, the pooled uh, events which were analyzed were 71 and 130. Now this 130 events which were analyzed of that, only 22 events came from the pooled phase two, phase three trial. So if I now go back to the FDA recommendation, I needed at least 121 events to make the calculation. So what did they do? They opened up the canvas trial and they took the data out, around 108 patients, pulled them together. Now they have 130 patients, which is more than 121, were adequately powered, and they said it is safe. My problem is, when you've opened up the Canvas trial, you've taken patients in both primary and secondary cohort. And then you have pulled it with the primary cohort, which is the pooled phase two, phase three trial. Now the safety is in which patient? My patient sitting in front of me cannot have an MI and, and also not an MI. It is either of the two. It cannot be both. You cannot mix them together. It's a polluted data. The same thing has happened in the Empire's outcome trial. You know, they had such la la less number of MACE, 54 uh, number of MACE in the pooled phase two, phase three data. So they had to open up the Empire's outcome trial at one year. Take the, and remember, 99% of the patients had established cardiovascular disease. So that's secondary. And these 54 events were predominantly primary. You pull them together, and drug is safe, it can come to the market. Again, the question comes, it's a polluted data. Is safety is in which population? Is the safety in those without cardiovascular disease? I think this cannot answer that question. Neither can Canvas nor the uh, Empire's outcome or the pooled analysis can answer that question. So with this backdrop, if we look into the DAPA, 
and it gives us a very important question, raises a very important question. Canvas trial was opened up, Emperage outcome was opened up, why is declare to me not opened up? And the answer is very simple. If you looked at the pool phase two, phase three data of the dapagliflozin, they were analyzing 176 events. So they were already in the green zone and you need not open up declare to me 53. So it's already there. And look at the upper limit of confidence interval, 1.070 less than 1.3. Now, ideally, FDA should have said there is no need to do a declared ME58 because you're less than 1.3. Why waste money doing an uh, you know, outcome trial? It is so robust just from there. Not only that, they had two RCTs and its meta-analysis where one of the primary endpoints were cardiovascular disease right at the outset. And if you look at that data, again, they were analyzing 128 events, those with established cardiovascular disease. And again, the upper limit of confidence interval was less than 1.3. But then again, it's unfair because the other two molecules have you know, a decrease in mortality and uh, an additional labeling. So if declared ME58 is not done with this data, you know, uh, sorry, uh, dapagliflozin is not going to get that additional indication. So if you ask me, this is a dream run of a trial, of a molecule, getting an approval right away from the pool phase two, phase three data. You don't have to open up your trial. You don't have to pay a penalty on your p-value. And you just have your randomized control trial and from which you get the data. And in each of the two arms are so big that each arm is equivalent to an Emperage outcome trial. So we're most likely going to get the result from declared ME58. So how does uh, dapagliflozin fit into the picture? Well, evidence level E, which is again my take. If you look from a primary cardiovascular disease prevention, CANA, EMPA is plus minus because it's a polluted data that we are looking at. But with DAPA, it's robust clearance that it has got from its pool phase two, phase three data. And these are the population who represent more than 85% of the patients in your clinic. From a secondary cardiovascular prevention cohort, CANA and EMPA are already there. We have to wait for declared ME58 before we can say that DAPA is in the same league as that of the other two. So this is the declared to me uh, you know, uh, algorithm. They are going to follow this and uh, we're eagerly waiting for this data because it's looking big enough and probably this is the only data which is going to answer the question whether dapagliflozin, like its counterpart or unlike its counterpart in the primary prevention cohort is going to sh show us some benefit or not. I'll end by a couple of quotations. Our duty as a physician first is clinical integrity. We have to follow evidence-based medicine, standards of care, codes of ethics, professionalism and patient safety. We just can't do away with patient safety even if cost is a consideration. It's just, it's not, it's unethical. And uh, why is so much of uh, controversy being generated on RCT and real life and all those things? It's because evidence-based medicine is a very new concept. It was first described in 1992. You know, unlike uh, if you compare this with Wikipedia's in 1970s, this is a really a new concept that we are seeing. A new approach to teaching med medicine, a revolution that we are seeing in medical practice. It takes time for us uh, to, to, accommodate, to, to accommodate and to inhale, to take inside the evidence-based medicine and then vomit it out as part of a clinical practice. So with this, I'll end that uh, we still have very robust data in the secondary prevention cohort with number of molecules. The main area which we really need answer today is the primary prevention cohort. And we have seen that even UKPDS in its trial period of 10 years have not shown any cardiovascular benefit with the drugs that it has used or with intensive lowering of plasma glucose. We are seeing molecular benefits today more than glucose lowering with, with all these molecules. It will be wonderful if we have molecules in both primary and secondary cohort taking care of cardiovascular outcomes. And the only trial which can give us that answer is declared ME58. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goshal, for excellent and unbiased presentation. Uh, when I was reading uh, CBD real trial, I always had a question in mind whether uh, it is important to use this uh, group of drugs in patients who have, uh, do not have established CBD, but I think you cleared most of the doubts. From cardiology point of view, if you look at the ASC 2017 guidelines, it does mention use of uh, gliflozins in patients who have diabetes with established CVD. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you, sir. We'll conclude Thank the you. session. Thank, Thank you. you.